Good morning. I'm Sydney Schreider, and this is Teresa Hackett, Caroline Hackett, and David Harsh. And this morning, we will do, be discussing our project to assess the establishment of a ceramic water filter factory in Limpopo Province, South Africa. In 2012, the World Health Organization estimated that 780 million people lack access to an improved water source. And for reference, 780 million people is two and a half times the population of the United States. And as large as that number is, it's even incomplete because the definition of an improved water source is somewhat lacking. And the water access crisis is, water access crisis is greater than it might seem. In addition, water quality is also a great problem facing developing communities. In 2004, the WHO estimated that 1.8 million deaths each day are due to diarrheal disease. And many of these are among children and due to preventable causes such as untreated water. One of the solutions to solve this problem is a ceramic water filter, which is a point of use treatment device, which means it's used at the household level, and it uses both physical filtration and chemical disinfection. And so it's essentially a clay pot, looks like a flower pot, that sits within a standard five gallon bucket, as you can see here, and water passes through the filter, is both filtered and disinfected, and then sits within a protected reservoir accessed by a tap. And this helps prevent recontamination of the water. It's made from clay, a combustible material. We personally use uh, sawdust silver nanoparticles, and water. And so when you have the filter made of clay, sawdust, and water, and you put it in the kiln, the sawdust combusts, leaving small pore spaces within the ceramic media that allow wa allows water to pass through, but it traps your particulate matter. So this enables your physical filtration process. And then the silver nanoparticles act as a chemical disinfectant. And ceramic water filters have been proven to be a low cost, which we'll describe later, effective device. Laboratory tests have shown up to a 99% removal of E. coli concentration in effluent water. And then field studies have shown a 60% diarrheal incidence rate among households using this technology. And now Teresa will take you through the filter making process. Thanks, Sydney. Um, so many of you in the room know that we're actually a three-year running project with JPC. And I'd like to give you a little bit of background about our previous research to give a little context. So three summers ago, a group of students went to uh, Limpopo province to see if these ceramic water filters were even needed in the region, and if they were, whether it'd be feasible. And so they did a feasible, feasibility study and uh, determined there was both a desire, need, and willingness to pay. Um, they did research in two villages and determined that um, in these two villages, the water samples collected, only 4% actually passed the World Health Organization standards for quality water. So there's definitely that need. Um, so the following summer, we returned to start doing construction of the factory to produce these filters. And so not only did we work on the infrastructure, but we also built um, relationships, and one of which was with um, a local uh, pottery cooperative known as the Mukundeni, Mukundeni Pottery Cooperative, which is about 50 women potters. And throughout the entire time, we've actually been partnered with the University of Venda, which is a local university in the area. And so last year, uh, we returned to assess what we had already done and then to also finalize and optimize some of the processes and relationships that we've been working on for um, all that time. And so I'd like to give a little bit more of a background of um, the actual filter making production process. So as you can see, there's a flow chart. And it's actually a pretty quick and simple um, process to do. So you first extract the clay. And we had a deposit that's just down the road from our site. And then you allow it to dry before you can hammer mill it into a very fine um, mixture. And you then mix it with the clay, um, sorry, with the sawdust and water that Sunia talked about earlier. And um, we have a press that actually um, has a mold that makes into the shape of the filter. Um, after that, you allow it to dry, and then you can fire it. And after it's cooled, you can test it for um, its flow rate, which is the amount of time it takes for the water to pass through. And if it passes the flow rate test, you can then do the silver application and then test it for the quality um, for bacterial removal. Um, so we knew this process coming in from the very beginning. However, it was definitely um, going to take time to refine it to actually work on our site. So this last summer, we worked on um, making it as efficient and effective as we could. Um, and we try to determine the most, uh, the perfect recipe for the filter because um, depending on the site and the clay that you're working with, there's a different ratio of clay to sawdust that you need in order to obtain that flow rate that you want. Um, so we made several batches of different clay to sawdust ratios throughout the summer. And um, we leveraged the potter's expertise with the local clay and even local weather. Because when it came to understanding the drying and um, how many days it would take to conduct the whole process, we realized that the drying process is really important to avoid um, the filters from cracking and to, um, to try to get the best uh, um, results after firing. 
And so in the end, we determined that the winning recipe was the 9 to 1 ratio, um, 9 to, uh, to 1 with clay to sawdust. And it had 100% coliform bacterial removal after we applied the silver. And it had um, an ideal flow rate of 2 liters per hour. So this is very encouraging results, and we're continuing to work on it. Um, however, um, this is really great after three years of research to, to see that we've actually gotten the product to work. So um, Cindy's actually going to talk again about how we um, worked on community building over the summer as well. So another major focus of our project was community building with the women. And this was both to improve our relationship with the women at the cooperative, but also increase community buy-in within the project. And we identified a few necessary elements for effective factory management, and this included communication channels within the women at the cooperative, and also between the cooperative and UVA and Univen, as well as a factory manager with sufficient technical knowledge. And most of our work in the community building was done through informal interactions with the women. So as you can see in the picture, this is our graduate student mentor, Carly Krauss. And we, as we would work with the women on the filters, we would ask them about their opinions on the filters, cultural perceptions they had about the factory, and also just generally how they thought the, the project was going. And there were also some more formal interviews conducted by one of our Univen community partners. And also through this process, we really realized the importance of answering all of our research questions within a cultural context. And we realized this coming into the process, but given the really complicated and integrated nature of the cooperative within the Mukundeni Cooperative, we really realized how important it was to be cognizant and considerate of the complex power dynamics within the cooperative and also the um, intricate and close-knit relationships that the women had with each other. We realized that this was important in building relationships and moving forward with the project. And now Caroline will discuss our community marketing survey. Thanks, Sydney. So in order to tailor our advertising and marketing campaign about the filter, as well as an education and outreach program promoting hygiene and safe water practices, we conducted a community survey in the two larger urban centers in the Venda region. We surveyed 187 participants and asked people questions such as where did they get their water, whether or not they treat their water, and whether or not they think there's a problem with water quality. We also asked questions regarding community networks and information pathways. To that end, we asked people do they belong to groups within their communities, where did they get information relevant to their communities and their households, and where did they commonly learn about water and health issues. Some of our most significant results from the survey are displayed here in these pie charts. On the left um, are the responses to the question, where do people learn about water and health issues? We found that people, the majority of people learn from school and through clinics and government programs. We also asked participants um, how they would prefer to receive information from us through these programs and found that most people would prefer informational pamphlets, live demonstrations, and videos. Um, so using all this information from our survey, we decided to focus a large part of the implementation of our programs on schools, health clinics, and hospitals. We'd also like to leverage the existing community infrastructure, um, community networks, and work with local churches and civic organizations, which we found are very popular within especially the rural communities. Um, we'd also like to do live demonstrations at the popular open-air public markets and shopping districts. We piloted our education program with a classroom of middle schoolers with promising results and also reached out to the Regional Department of Health to begin the relationship with health clinics. And now David will talk to us about filter pricing. Sure. But before we talk about filter pricing, uh, we also had to conduct a more specific analysis on the cost that would go in to the production of each filter. Uh, so we determined that it would cost about $15 a filter uh, to produce and then distribute uh, the filters. This took into consideration a fair wage uh, for the Mukundeni Cooperative women that we would be working with. Um, but then after determining the cost of $15, uh, we then believed that it would be feasible to sell the filters at $28. We were able to derive this number by talking with many retail store owners uh, that believed that we would be able to sell the filters effectively at the $28 price point. Um, but we also took into consideration many different substitutes uh, within the region. Um, specifically, there was a point of use um, water treatment piece of equipment that actually boiled water at the household in a bucket uh, that used electricity. And uh, that product was sold in the marketplace uh, where we were working for $35. Uh, so we believe that selling it for $28, a filter that doesn't require a, um, any type of electricity um, would be uh, effective. We strongly believe that the profit margin, uh, $28 uh, selling point over a $15 cost, is crucial for the uh, viability of uh, developing a business uh, in the long term. Uh, if we're able to expand to other parts of South Africa or other parts of Africa as a whole, we'll need a healthy profit margin. Um, in addition to being able to empower the Mukundeni Cooperative of Women um, that we were working with. 
Um, so this is how we effectively determine the, the filter pricing. Uh, but overall, we also experienced some limitations um, with our work uh, this summer, including uh, limited resources. Uh, we didn't have unlimited money uh, that we would just be able to spend uh, throughout the summer. We had limited time uh, that we were only able to spend about six to eight weeks um, actually working on the project. Uh, but then we also had uh, mechanical difficulties. Uh, it's amazing how uh, different things uh, that we're working with over the summer uh, tend to break down, especially when you're using clay and sawdust and uh, just, uh, you know at a factory. Uh, but we were able to overcome these obstacles and provide effective solutions uh, for the women. Moving forward, we are excited to say that we were able to produce and provide 50 filters uh, for the different women uh, that are working at the factory, so that they can use uh, the filters at home to be able to purify their water. Um, and we also believe that we are getting closer to actually selling. Uh, the filter in the market, uh, especially with Rachel Schmidt, a Fulbright scholar from the University of Virginia, currently working on the ground at, um, in Limpopo province um, as our current uh, factory manager. Um, so she's solving the day-to-day -day issues uh, that are arising um, currently. Um, overall, we would like to thank the Jefferson Public Citizen Project for just providing us with an amazing opportunity uh, the past few summers to f more fully understand the intricacies that come into uh, developing a business from dealing with so many different stakeholder issues and many different interests along with those stakeholders, um, but then also dealing with obstacles efficiently and being able to overcome them. We believe that this type of experience is going to help us in our careers um, moving forward. Um, we would also like to thank uh, Carly Krauss and our graduate student mentor and our professor, uh, mentor, uh, James Smith, um, for just all the continued guidance that they have been able to provide for us. Um, and then we would also like to thank uh, countless other individuals that, is, that have helped us along the way. Thank you.